So good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the Project Climate Intelligence, in short, CLINT. We're going to listen to four uh, presentations about the last uh, summer uh, heat wave, uh, its impact, uh, its drivers. And so uh, this would be this is part of uh, uh, the CLINT project, which is a European project, which is combining uh, uh, climate science uh, and artificial intelligence to produce climate services, enhanced climate services, which are then provided to the stakeholders and the public through uh, climate services information system. So I will stop here and uh, introduce the first speaker, who is Arthur Essenfelder, uh, who is going to present uh, a summer of extreme drought risk monitoring in 2022 together with Andrea Toretti. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. So it's, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to show uh, uh, the development that we've been doing in JRC. So the goal of the presentation, uh, we can say that is true. So the first one, it's uh, related to the session, is to show a little bit on the, uh, on the monitoring activity that we do in the JRC and try to give a kind of a broader context, uh, particularly on the drought event that we saw over Europe uh, in 2022 and that we're still seeing its effects. And the second one is also to, to show a little bit on the uh, data that can, for instance, feed in in the project and be relevant for, uh, for the development uh, uh, for the uh, more than three years available that are still uh, resting for the development of the project. Um, so uh, thanks, Andrea, for the presentation. So my name is Arthur. I'm, uh, I'm working at uh, the Joint Research Center, so part of the European Commission. Um, I'm working particularly on, uh, on a project and uh, an exploratory project uh, related to the implementation of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, machine learning uh, methods uh, in our uh, disaster risk management unit. I'll be spending very few words into that just to show a little bit on what we're doing. So it's, uh, it's in kind of in the initial stages. But the main focus here is, uh, is, as the title says, is to show a little bit more on the, on the monitoring of the situation uh, uh, regarding 2022. So jumping straight ahead to that, uh, what can I say is that we have two uh, tools uh, and web portals basically that uh, that we make available to, to everyone. So this is uh, open to, to everyone to just go click in the link and you can see more or less the two windows that we're seeing here on the left side. We have uh, two different scales. So one is on the European level, so it's called the European Drought Observatory. Uh, and the second one is uh, the Global Drought Observatory. So it's uh, at, the, at the global scale. Uh, they provide uh, similar information, of course, with different spatial extents, but uh, they might have a little bit of different suits on the, on, the, on the data utilization and also the set of indicators that might be available in the, in the portal. So uh, regarding to the European Drought Observatory, which should be the focus of the presentation today, because uh, even though we saw uh, 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 drought events and heat waves going on around the globe, uh, the focus here is a little bit more over Europe. So it's, uh, it's basically like this has is a collaboration between DGM and the Water Scarcity and Drought Expert Group. And uh, it's in continuous development, so we foresee also to, to further develop that and provide new uh, sets of indicators in the future as well. So for instance, uh, potentially the incorporation of uh, the SPI, the Standardized Precipitation Evaporation, uh, uh, Evapotranspiration Index as well. So this so far is not available, but in the future likely will be. And we also provide information not just related to the hazard. So let's say, for instance, uh, monitoring the situation on the uh, uh, intensity of a drought event, but also on uh, impact related information. So uh, some indicators are uh, focusing a little bit more for, for the agricultural sector, uh, while other information, is, uh, it can be a little bit more like uh, tailored to, for instance, to the uh, vegetation uh, using satellite information. This is the uh, it's a slide that kind of summarizes the, the type of information that we have available in the portal right now. So we have uh, the standardized precipitation index, SPI. I think uh, everyone should be familiar with that uh, uh, here in Clint, but also nice to show with people that are following online. We provide these at different accumulation periods from one up to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, two years. You can change that by just right clicking on the, on the, on the, on the, name of an indicator in the portal and selecting uh, both the time that you want to see 
but also the accumulation period. We have other indicators that are related to the soil moisture anomaly, uh, vegetation uh, uh, anomaly coming from FFR, low flow index, and uh, also indicators related to heat and cold uh, wave index. Uh, part of our activities as well is to provide information uh, to the member states and the general public in, in general, let's say, on, uh, on how the uh, uh, situation might be evolving. We've related to extremes, we've related to droughts, and uh, we can do that by also by uh, issuing reports. So, for instance, uh, we issue a report uh, by assessing and uh, evaluating the evolution of the drought event in Europe. Uh, which has been published in August of 2022. So it has been quite a busy summer for us in the in the unit to, to develop these, these activities. But we also have other ones that goes a little bit like uh, uh, back in time and also the ones that are being produced right now. So for instance, we, we produce also analysis uh, between the 2019 and 2021 extreme drought in the La Plata Basin in South America. There's, uh, there's currently undergoing an uh, update of this one. So this event is still going on. So it's, uh, and we're still monitoring and updating the situation over there. Uh, by the beginning of the year, so we saw that uh, we, we kind of identified that the situation was uh, pointing to a, a, a draft condition in, uh, uh, in basically in the southern part of, of, uh, of, of Europe, so in the Mediterranean area. So we, we kind of uh, uh, produced also this, uh, this report in, in, in February focusing, of course, in the western part of uh, the Mediterranean. We then in March issue another report uh, related to the uh, impacts in northern Italy. Uh, and then uh, uh, later this year, also in August, uh, a little bit later in the month, also a situation uh, particularly to the, uh, to the drought and water scarcity in the Netherlands. The image that you see in the right uh, is just the SPI accumulation uh, period of 90 days. So this is uh, computed at daily level uh, using ERA5 data. And it's just to show an indication that uh, uh, basically it's just showing like uh, uh, for the past 12 months, so from August of 2021 to August of uh, 2022, how that the situation is just not, not in Europe, but also is global. We focus a little bit more in Europe, we can see also on this uh, animation here, uh, the evolution of the SPI in this case is uh, a one month accumulation, so 30 days. And it kind of shows like uh, the, the reasoning on why we have issued these reports. Uh, so for instance, we can see that there was a, a strong like uh, a, a, a negative anomaly in terms of precipitation over the Western part of the Mediterranean. So that's why we issued that report in February. And then we know that this has kind of expanded over the rest of Europe uh, uh, for the following months. We have here the key findings of the basically the report that we issued in, uh, 2000, uh, in August of 2022 covering the, the, the European territory, let's say. So this has been uh, uh, something that uh, has been, for instance, uh, further expanding and worsening as early as of August. So this is like, uh, of, of course, it has been like uh, written in August, so it refers back to that time. And we have also other, other, other kinds of, uh, of uh, 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 let's say, impacts and uh, reported uh, consequences that I'll be explaining a little bit later on or kind of touching a little bit on those. As I mentioned, we, we saw that this was already beginning in, uh, in, uh, uh, as early as January. So we could see, for instance, the SPI1 was showing a little bit on the negative anomaly over Spain and Portugal and also on the southern part of France and the western part of Italy, so northwestern part of Italy. And also through the soil moisture anomaly, this was also showing that we're having a negative anomaly over uh, uh, similar areas. In February, we could see that the situation was particularly bad on the northern western part of, uh, of Italy. Again, coming back, referring to the, to the report that, uh, that we issued there. And also uh, showing a little bit here on how the soil moisture anomaly was also uh, uh, represented on that time. By that period, you could also see that the, this, uh, uh, the 2021 and 2022 period, it was already showing to be quite warm and dry. So it does uh, also an indication of, uh, 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 of another extreme event that, uh, that we could see and that further developed during the, the, the summer, which is the heat wave. But I'm not touching so much here the heat wave. So again, the focus is on droughts. Going on to the March, we could see a lot of uh, impacts uh, uh, in terms of stream flow. So we saw particularly like in the Po uh, 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 river basin, we saw a drastic reduction of uh, stream flow. 
uh, we could also capture those with uh, satellite. We could see the difference between previous years and the new one, like how much it has been actually reduced, the amount of uh, uh, the identification of water areas. And uh, also through, through modeling, we could see that the, the results were, were quite uh, drastically mm -hmm. low. Uh, one of the main factors that has been uh, contributing to that is the uh, particularly low uh, accumulation of uh, snow over the Alps, which then during summer times leads to a, a lower than expected uh, stream flow in, uh, in a river basin that is basically dominated by, by this kind of, uh, of dynamics. So, for instance, in the, the plots that we see here on the right side, we see the uh, the, let's say the, the, very, the average accumulation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, snowfall over the, the Alps and how it was like behaving in the, in the, up to the 28th of February in 2022. And both plots are beginning since the 1st of September of the previous year. In March, we saw that the situation was expanding to other parts of Europe. So we saw, for instance, the SPI-3 was showing a little bit of uh, negative anomaly uh, over Romania and other parts of Eastern Europe. And while the SPI-1 was showing a drastic like an, uh, uh, um, coverage area, kind of uh, the whole part of uh, 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 Northern Europe, like Germany, Poland, and other countries, and also still persistent over the, the Alps. Jumping now to the, let's say, current situation, or at least as of August, uh, uh, we see that uh, we still have a very significant uh, uh, soil moisture uh, anomaly uh, over kind of whole of Europe. So this has been an event that has particularly hit hard, like uh, the Western part, but also other parts of Europe have been hit. And uh, also the FFR anomaly related to the photosynthetically activity of vegetation is also showing like uh, uh, a negative anomaly, particularly over France, Italy, Germany, and uh, uh, Romania and Hungary. This, of course, has the several different types of impacts. So like uh, when we talk about uh, drought event in, uh, uh, in combination with a heat wave, uh, we can see, for instance, situations where we have like reduced uh, stream flow in rivers. Uh, this can lead to a situation that has been verified in the Po River, so for instance, seawater intrusion, uh, mm -hmm. but also like river transportation, which has been uh, uh, has been seen as uh, being disrupted in Germany. Other kind of things that are uh, uh, can be affected or sectors that can be affected are related to energy, so energy production, production, particularly from hydropower. And of course, we can uh, pretty much clear say that this is going to affect agriculture, which is the case. So we can uh, we. Kind of uh, expect to see a reduction of uh, 20 to 25 uh, uh, percent reduction in soybean and uh, uh, something like 70 uh, percent reduction in rice uh, in Italy. I'm not going to go so much here into details because the colleagues are also going to touch a little bit more on the past and in the future, but drought is expected to be like a growing concern in the future. Uh, so, this is something that uh, that uh, that uh, it's uh, important for us to keep in mind in order to develop products that can be also useful to, to end users. And uh, just very quick words on uh, on a little bit on the machine learning side that uh, that we're currently developing in the JRC. So we have this project that I mentioned before that is called IAX that uh, that is called AI Enhanced Climate Services. The idea is to is to to use tools and methods related to machine learning and AI to see if we can better characterize the uh, drought event and better identify its dynamics, like uh, evolving in time and space. And of course, at the European level, the European Commission, we have the the the, uh, the destination Earth, uh, Earth initiative. I think I'm already over my time, so I, I'll stop it here, and uh, can leave the floor. I'm not sure if I should take questions or if I should just pass here. Thank you very much, Arthur. If there is a, one question in the room, I don't see any question in the chat so far. Otherwise, we can move on with the next speaker and then keep all the questions for the end of the seminar. The chat. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> so the next presentation is a. Uh, collective work by uh, Eduardo Zurita, uh, Elena Soplaki, Andrea Toretti, and David Barrio Pedro. And so, hi, Eduardo, please stay. 
Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, yeah, this second talk um, will be focused on giving more paleoclimate and historical context on the summer um, 2022 event in mostly in Europe. Um, so I will give a, a, a perspective, a perspective more longer time scales so or millennial time scales based mostly on climate modeling. Uh, and then David Barrio Pedro and uh, Miklas, um, Miklas Luther will provide a more specific, um, well, a short time scale for the last centuries and also based on real data, not only modeling. Uh, so my name is Eduardo Farita, just for, for those of you who, who just see me for the first time. <clears throat> and I would like to start defining a little bit how this event, 2022 actually was reflected in the atmospheric circulation in, in Europe. So if we have a look now at the patterns of sea level pressure, so just the atmospheric circulation, uh, in this summer, in summer 2022, uh, so I show you here from left uh, to right, June, July, and August of sea level pressure. And if you look at the European uh, continent, which is just roughly in the middle of the plots. You see that in June, we see, well, mostly almost no anomalies. So these colors reflect the anomalies or the deviation from the mean. But in July, we start seeing a, a center of high pressure growing, centered over Europe, that actually is persistent and stubborn. It doesn't disappear in August, also for Europe. It's shifted also a little bit towards the east. Um, so that will be our definition of this extreme event uh, for the summer 2022 in Europe in terms of the atmospheric circulation. And one can ask ourselves, uh, do these type of events happen in the past? So this type of very persistent blocking high pressure event over Europe, did it happen in the past? Was it related to external drivers of climate or not? That type of question will help us to address if that will increase in the future. Um, under climate change. So if we look a little bit at the um, past um, centuries assimilated by climate models. So we have we need, of course, to have information about the external drivers of climate over the past centuries. And I will show you the two main uh, external drivers. So of course, we didn't have a lot of strong changes in greenhouse gases, but we did have very strong changes in volcanic activity which is considered to be the most stronger climate driver in the past millennium. And you can see that, uh, well, this is a reconstruction based on, on information in polar ice cores of, of uh, volcanic activity. And you can see that the volcanic eruptions tend to cluster in certain <coughs> centuries. So for instance, around 1200, we have actually a very strong activity. Uh, also in around uh, 1800, at the beginning of the 19th century, there was a strong volcanic activity, but there were some centuries, for instance, uh, for um, a thousand years ago, and now, in which the volcanic activity is very weak. Uh, this has a strong impact, and we can ask ourselves, is it a driver for this type of events or not? Another important driver of the past millennium is, of course, changes in the solar output, in the solar radius. And here, the information that we have about past solar activity is a little bit more uncertain. I present here from left to right, so the, the axis is time. So different reconstructions of solar activity. And you can see that there is a, a, a large uncertainty. Uh, but we can see that roughly the solar irradiance or solar activity in the past followed a similar pattern than the volcanic eruptions. So a thousand years ago, it was higher and then we had a little ice age uh, periods of, of low um, solar radiance about 1600 and then the solar activity increased towards the uh, 20th century so the combination of these two drivers can be used to drive uh, climate models and i show you now uh, one simulation with a, a f system model uh, from the max Planck institute of meteorology which is a red line this is the simulated uh, near global, uh, no European temperature. Uh, and it is um, compared with reconstructions of this temperature, which are, for instance, the green and the blue line. Uh, these reconstructions are based on so called proxy data, so mainly triggering data that are, are able to capture the temp temperature in each year in the past. 
And we see here these three periods that I was referring before. So for 2000 years, we had temperatures that are elevated, a bit elevated, it's the so-called Roman one period. Then we had also a period of roughly elevated temperatures in the medieval one period. We had then later about 1600, the little ice age, so uh, two or three centuries with very low temperatures, and then the recent warming uh, that continued until, until now. But we can see that actually the model simulations and these reconstructions agree rather well. So we can ask ourselves, do this model produce this type of events as the 2022? So we have a, a physical system, a laboratory in the computer that is able to replicate the climate of the past reasonably at some, some point. And um, so I will, in the, the next results, I will just focus on the last thousand years, not the last 2000 years, just to be more specific. Um, and here uh, I will show you, uh, or I actually show you what I defined is an index of the 2022 event. So this blue line is computed or tell me how intense was this pattern, the pattern that we observe this year through the last thousand years in the simulation. So for instance, very high numbers, for instance, in this particular year means that that summer was very similar to 2022. And the numbers in this blue line close to zero means that that summer has, was completely different to 2022. And this actually, this line is uh, very interesting. It's the most interesting result of my talk. So it covers the period from 1850 to 2100. So I have spliced here three simulations, the past uh, 1000 simulation, the historical simulation, and one scenario simulation for the next 100 years. And what we see immediately so we see that actually this index shows no trend, no coherence with that external forcing that I showed before. So there is, you don't see any impact of volcanoes or solar activity or even greenhouse gases in the next one. So concerning circulation, what the model is telling me is that actually these variations are all random, are all chaotic. There are no, no impact of external force. However, uh, the fact that I cannot reach a number here of one for this index, it also telling me that the model is not able to produce a summer 2022 in any of the years. So there is actually no, there, there are summers that are similar to this year, but the model is never able to reproduce a summer like this. So that is pointing to deficiencies in the model, one possibility. Or well, the other possibility is that this summer was so strange that 1,000 years of simulation is not able to cover that small probability. So let's have a look now at the simulated pattern in this year, 1037, and you will see immediately the resemblance to this year, to 2022. Uh, again, we see, well, this is the pattern that I showed you before, just to compare. This is the observed pattern this year. And this is the pattern simulated by the model in the year 1037. And you see, uh, again, was this broken <clears throat> of a Europe in July, which intensifying very strongly and very strongly in August. The reason for this in, uh, intensification are unknown, but now we will could be able to look into the model itself, if uh, what could be the drivers of this type of events. So we have several events of this sort, and we will be able to look at it. However, this, as I said, uh, the model produces something similar, but not completely similar. If we look back at the simulated patterns, and oh, sorry, at the observed pattern, and in the simulated patterns, there are some shifts. They are not in the same place. That's what the model is not able to produce an event that is exactly like the one we observed. It's shifted. So the, the, the model dynamics are not realistic enough to produce an event as observed. So we have to take this into account for the future. We will not be able to simulate uh, events that are as realistic as we observe. Uh, and that has consequences. For instance, when we compute the um, temperature simulated in this year and related to this atmospheric pattern. And I, this is my last, my last slide before I hand over to David. We see, for instance, the temperature uh, that was uh, observed at that summer 
1037 in the model. And we see that the heat wave is produced much farther to the east. It's actually almost Russia, almost Siberia. It's not produced in Europe. So that subtle difference in the position of the blocking centers in the model gave rise to a large difference in the heat wave production. So there's something uh, that we have to remember. So the models are very good laboratories, but they have deficiencies. And we have to be careful then when interpreting the results. And with this, I hand over to, to David Barrio Pedro that will give us, give us an overview about the last centuries based on proxy data. Thank you, Thank you Eduardo. Just remind the attendees that there is a question and answer space where you can write your question and we will then uh, ask the uh, presenter to, to provide replies. David? Okay, thank you. Uh, so. uh, <laughs> Okay, very good. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Barrio Pedro. I'm going to continue uh, with Eduardo's talk uh, by placing this summer in a broad and temporal context. I will start with the paleoclimate period and move into the historical period and the more recent reanalysis period. Uh, in, the, in that case, we will use only observations, no, no model simulations at all. And uh, we will also address different uh, spatiotemporal scales from the European and seasonal scale to the more local and, and daily scale. So starting with the um, long-term context, doesn't work. Ah, okay, here. Uh, uh, you can see uh, in the left, that figure is the uh, distribution of European summer temperature normally since 1500. Uh, this figure has been obtained using the best uh, data set, which has been extended back in time with, the, uh, with an European reconstruction of the by Luther Bakker et al. So uh, here we have more than 500 uh, years of data. The uh, vertical lines are the each individual summer, okay? And you can see the coldest ones uh, in the left and the warmest ones on the right. And the results are obvious. We, we can see that the warmest summers in Europe have uh, all occurred in the 21st century, and 2022 is by far the warmest on record. Uh, it's interesting because it is well beyond the tail of the, the distribution, but it's, it's also far from a previous record-breaking summers, including 2021, which was the warmest uh, one uh, until now. Okay. On the right, you can see the, the spatial distribution of the warmest uh, temperatures um, across Europe. And uh, for the historical period, in this case, since 1880 until 2010 only. The, here, the, the height of the bar is the temperature anomaly. And the color identifies the decade when this record-breaking summer occurred. Okay, the crosses identify uh, summers the, that correspond to the 21st century. So we can see that by 2010, already almost all of Europe had its warm summer in the 21st century. Okay, highlighting here two summers, which were the 2000, 2003 that affected Western Europe and 2010 that affected Eastern Europe. If we update this map with the last 12 years, mm, uh, this is what we get. Uh, there are new records in Europe, although the 2003-2010 summers <laughs> are still there. And interestingly, there have no been um, many local records for 2022. Uh, these are the, the, the grid points here with a dot. They have been mainly confined to Iberia and some regions of the UK or Central Europe. Uh, so no many local records at this grid point scale in spite of being the warmest summer 
on Europe but uh, at European scales. To, so to further understand this, this figure we show all the top five warmest summers, and you can see that 2003 and 2010 were characterized by um, mega heat wave episodes, episodes that affected Western and Eastern Europe respectively, but there were also regions with near normal cold temperatures at that time. And differently, recent summers have been characterized by warm temperatures all over Europe. And there are no so clear signatures of a mega heat wave event confined to a specific region. And uh, we can now understand the, this reduced number of local records for 2022 because the warmest areas in Europe this summer occur over the same region that was previously affected by the 2003 mega heat wave event when the temperatures were higher therein. But in spite of this, 2022 is warmer because it was uh, very warm all over Europe. And these results also suggest that maybe we are moving from summers with one mega heat wave event to summers with multiple mega heat wave events. So to further understand this, here uh, we show some heat wave metrics that were computed um, with the heat wave metrics that have been developed for the clean project. And uh, in this case, we employ era five reanalysis, but at that time we did not have uh, we did not have data for August, so the analysis is confined to June and July 2022. And to illustrate the metrics, I, I show here an example. This is for a grid point near Milan, and the black line is the daily mean temperature. The dashed line is the threshold that we employed to define a heat wave, which is the 90 percent. A heat wave is here defined as a period of at least three consecutive days with temperatures above, above that threshold. And below, in red, you can see the heat wave events at that grid point, uh, shown as the temperature exceedancy about the 90 percent, okay, according to the uh, this axis on the right. So we can see that uh, this grid point, there were only in June and July four heat wave episodes, and this is one of the metrics we can the number of episodes for June and July. The second one is the longest heat wave spell that probably was the, this one here, the last one. Another metric is the heat wave uh, amplitude, which measure, measures the maximum daily peak intensity, I mean the highest bar in this plot. And the fourth metric is an integrated one of all these heat wave characteristics. And this is the final the heat wave magnitude, which measures the, is the sum of all the temperature exceedances for all heat wave days of the sun. Okay, so four metrics, and on the right you can see the spatial maps for uh, Europe, and we can see that there were almost no place in Europe um, without heat waves. Okay, and um, but in some regions, including mainly over the Mediterranean region, there were several heat wave episodes, sometimes four or five in just two months. But in addition to this, some of these heat waves were very long lasting. This is showing the upper panel on the right. This is the longest heat wave spell duration. And we can see that the same region, the Mediterranean one, uh, had uh, heat wave events lasting more than 10 days, sometimes approaching two weeks in a row. Uh, the heat wave amplitude is, uh, pattern is different. It's shown on the uh, bottom line on the left. Uh, in this case, the highest values occur in Central Europe and the UK, where they reach it for the first time, the 40 degrees temperature, first of all, they're in. And uh, the last map, the bottom right, is the accumulated heat wave metric, the heat wave magnitude that shows that the most affected region in Europe was, again, the Mediterranean, in particular, Iberian Peninsula, with heat wave magnitudes approaching 60 degrees. That means that all days of June and July had temperatures at least one degree above the 90 percent. So almost all summer in a, in, in a heat wave conditions. Okay, uh, and limitation of this approach is that we cannot grasp uh, the, how these different heat wave events affected different regions. If they were simultaneous or not. So we also adopted a different approach and an event based approach in order to identify heat wave events. This, uh, in this case, uh, we look for especially coherent patterns uh, of heat wave conditions that affect large areas simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And then we track these spatial maps in time 
to follow the evolution of the heat wave events. Okay, in doing so, uh, we found that there were uh, different heat wave events. In fact, some of them can be cataloged as mega heat waves affecting Europe, Europe during this summer. And here we saw the three most prominent ones. The first one occurring in June, and it was a long lasting one, more than uh, two weeks, and it mainly affected southwestern, southwestern Europe. Uh, there was uh, another uh, mega heat wave in July that affected uh, Western Europe, but also some uh, regions of the Mediterranean and Northern Europe. And the last one in August, another persistent event, in this case affecting uh, uh, Northeastern Europe. There are similarities across these uh, heat wave events, uh, as shown, for example, the, with the contours, they show the geopotential age anomalies at 500 pascals, averaged for the period that is shown on the title. And you can see that uh, there are high pressure anomalies in all cases associated with the heat, these heat wave episodes, but there are also differences. In, for example, the uh, heat wave event in August was as if with a blocking pattern, which is an isolated high pressure region in the north, high latitudes. And these systems are quasi stationary, they don't move a lot. Uh, and that means that uh, they yield uh, uh, persistent heat wave conditions over the areas that uh, are affected by the system, as shown by the shading, which is the number of heat wave days. Uh, associated with this specific event. Differently, the June and July heat waves were more transient. Okay, the shading is low, is lower. And uh, in the particular case of the June heat wave, it was associated with a subtropical ridge, I mean, a polar migration of the subtropical ridge. And uh, the July heat wave was a pattern in between the June and August ones. I mean, this is an schematic of the uh, atmospheric patterns associated with, with these heat waves. Um, so similarities, but also differences in the weather system and also in the associated processes. Um, this is an analysis, uh, fast analysis that we carry out in order to um, describe the atmospheric contribution factors to the temperature escalation that was observed in uh, Iberia in the case of the June heat wave and France for the July heat wave. Okay, the uh, gray line in this uh, is the um, spatial mean over this region, uh, evolution of the temperature anomaly. This uh, evolution is computed with respect to the first day the heat wave affected that region, which in the case of Iberia was 10 of June. And we can see the temperature escalation here in gray, and the color lines are the evolution of the contributing terms to, to this temperature anomaly that are inferred from the uh, temperature tendency equation. And the results indicate that uh, this uh, warming in Iberia was mainly associated with warm advection, horizontal advection from uh, Northern Africa, okay? Differently, the, uh, in the France, uh, uh, case study for the July heat wave, the uh, dominant uh, term was mainly the uh, adiabatic warming by subsidence, which is the blue line shown here. So this suggests that there, there could be also different contributing terms. And yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to end with an, an attribution e exercise of, of this summer, but I'm going to skip this slide because this is not mine. Uh, but you can see that in the World Weather Attribution website, where they found that uh, this um, the UK event was at least 10 times more likely due to human activities. And here we apply a different approach, but also another uh, um, attribution methodology, which is based on flow analogs. Okay, and on the left, you can see the average conditions, atmospheric circulation conditions for the 11, 12, uh, and 19 July. Um, and the associated temperature anomalies. What we did here was to search for flow analogs of this atmospheric pattern in the past. And we reconstruct the temperatures associated with that pattern uh, using these flow analogs. And the, uh, the results are so here the, with the gray dark uh, whiskers. And we can see that similar atmospheric conditions uh, would have caused uh, uh, okay, now caused warm warmer temperatures than they would cause in the past. And this is due to 
to the climate change. Uh, I don't have time, I'm afraid, to explain this or, or the other panel. Uh, but uh, an interesting uh, result of this appro analog approach is that we can also explore other potential drivers, the heat wave, not only the atmospheric circulation, for example, the uh, soil moisture. And these are the spatial patterns that we reconstruct for the atmospheric circulation and the temperature anomalies as reconstructed from, from flow analogs that were preceded by either wet or dry conditions. We can see that when uh, we constrain um, with uh, dry analogs, we can reconstruct much better the observed temperature anomalies than with wet with wet uh, analogs, meaning that most likely uh, land atmosphere capping and the drought conditions already affected or contributed to exacerbate the magnitude of this event. And so now Nicholas is going to talk more about the drought. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Well, thank you very much, David. Um, my name is Nicholas Luther. I'm a PhD student from the Justus Liebig University. And we have prepared a short analysis of the drought of the, or a short analysis of the severity of the drought of this year's, of this year. And we have analyzed the ro 5 data set for the purpose covering the time period from 1950 to 2022. And as a drought indicator, we have used the standardized evapotranspiration precipitation index or in short the SPEI. And the SPEI is uh, essentially a index which uh, takes total precipitation and potential evapotranspiration into account builds a water balance and normalizes the variable such that we can simply interpret the scale in the sense like we have it here shown in this table. So this is how we identify drought conditions on the, with the SPEI, considering for instance, a drought condition as moderately dry, if the SPEI values range between minus 0.5 and minus one, severely dry from minus two between minus 1.5 and extremely dry as being smaller than minus two. Then we have uh, some experiments uh, where we define the spatial extent, but this I'm going to explain in a minute because it will be simpler. And we have also analyzed the SPI on different scales, as Arthur already mentioned, uh, that, there, that is also possible to analyze in different scales. And this is uh, a figure just for illustration example. So uh, we have here on the right hand side the 2022 event where we um, are seeing the summer, the extended summer and the full year, full year meaning for instance here for 2022 where we see the drought conditions from August 2021 to 2022. And as you can see here on the map, so um, we have in brown the extremely dry conditions, the severely dry and the moderate dry conditions. And if we compare, for instance, the 2022 summer with the 2018, we see that uh, especially the area of Spain was much stronger, um, was much stronger influenced by drought conditions and also that the special extent appears to be larger. For the 2003 event, you see, for instance, that the spatial extent here was a bit bigger for the uh, extremely dry conditions. For uh, March, uh, for the extended summer, we see, I would say, also that uh, the European was greatly influenced in all three summers by, a, by drought conditions. Where 2022 appears to be largely different from those two years were uh, on the 12 year scale, so really on the longer time scale, where we see that the drought conditions were persistent throughout whole Europe for the for this uh, 12 month period, which we couldn't see in 2018 and a bit weak, more weakly pronounced in 2003. Now, um, this was just for illustration how we could compare, let's say 2022 with a certain year. And now we want to put on a ranking for the last 70 years. And what we did here is simply that we calculated for each year on these three different timescales, the spatial extent of drought conditions we find. For instance, for the, we take the moderately dry conditions, and calculate how many grid points show these type of conditions. And when we do this, we can then simply do a ranking due to this metric and see uh, how the, let's say, how severe the uh, drought 2022 was, where we then define severe, so to say, that we observe conditions and the corresponding extent on Europe. And when we look, for instance, so these are a couple of panels, I know, but um, when we focus, for instance, here on the uh, extended summer in March from August, uh, with severely dry condition, we see that the 2022 event was one of was apparently the strongest on record and was also uh, considerably high in the moderately dry conditions. However, it was not that strong in the extremely dry condition, which points towards that there were many drought events over Europe, which were, however, not as strong as perhaps some other drought events in the past. When we have conducted, however, this analysis here, when we can plot, um, we thought then 
thinking one step backwards that when we analyze the 2022 uh, drought um, drought conditions you see that the um in scandinavia we have mostly wet conditions on the all three considered time scales which might bias a bit our results if we um, consider this full window. So we, we thought how sensible are our results here if we just focus instead on the smaller region, therefore excluding this region shown here in the green. And if we do this experiment, so to say that we only focus on the crowds in Central and Southern Europe, we see that the ranking is a, a bit difficult, a bit different. So in all the different metrics that we have considered here, the 2022 rocks appears to appear in the top four, an exception for this extremely dry condition over here, showing that com uh, compared with the last 72 events was one of the strongest drought events. And um, this can be even perhaps a bit further summarized. We thought that if we, so we have until now these conditions, which are typically used, which we also use for instance, which were also used in the drought uh, report of the JSC. And we summarized them a bit more on the next, uh, on the next um, slide. So we, we are checking now how much is the spatial extent of uh, of um, drought condition beds at least moderately dry. So we summarize all drought events that are below minus one, or all are below that are severely dry and all that are extremely dry. And now the ranking, as you can see for 2022, if we focus on these first uh, panels, is that the 2022 event is, except for this example here, always the uh, top summer, so to say top summer, and being that it shows the largest spatial extent of at least moderately dry or at least really dry conditions. For the at least extremely dry, we see a similar ranking. And this basically suggests to us that uh, the drought this year was uh, especially, was, may have, they may have been droughts, which were more severe in certain region, but given the uh, central and southern Europe domain, it appears that um, the spatial extent of drought condition has never been seen before, at least in this record in the 74 years, in the 71 years. Of course, this is just one metric of how to analyze it, so we have to, to just see um, how sensitive these results are when we use other metrics. Good, that's already everything from my side, and I will give to the next talk. So thank you very much for the, the presentation. I see we have a few questions in the chat. So for David, uh, I just just reading the, the question for the July heat wave. You show the subsidence vertical advection was the last just contribution with little diabetic heating. Subsequently, you showed uh, with analog analogs the dry soils likely exacerbated the event. How can I reconcile these two facts with soil atmosphere coupling? I would expect a large diabetic signal. David, can you reply to this one? Yeah. Can you repeat, please? Uh, I did not hear the question well. Mm -hmm. Mm, I cannot. <laughs> I mean, it, that it that does not mean that the the, the um, uh, coupling did not play a role. It, it is, because they, I, I said that it was a very uh, rough analysis. It, it was focused on the lower levels of the year and over average over a large scale space area. So there could be spatial differences that should be taken into account when. When approaching this, uh, it's also important to say that in the in when the different contributing terms are taken into account, uh, the diabetic heating is considered as a residual of the temperature tendency equation, and that could be a wrong as, assumption. So, in, in in fact, the analog exercise suggests that uh, this could be this could be the case. But in any in, in any case, there are uh, diabetic heating role during the the during the July heat wave but maybe that was not very important when uh, controlling the day-to-day -day variations which is what we address with the with the uh, 
that figure in particular. But uh, in the uh, analog exercise, what we explore is the role of preconditioning uh, and soil moisture deficit in amplifying uh, subsequent temperatures. So this is not the same analysis either. But uh, yes, we should uh, better address this. Thank you, David. There's many other questions, but I would suggest that maybe we move all the questions to the end, uh, and then so we have more more time to, to to discuss them. The next presentation is by CMCC, and so I see Veronica and Karma connected uh, online. Hello, everyone. So I would like to talk about the predictability of the 2022 summer. Uh, at seasonal time scale, um, we are all uh, people from, from CMCC. And um, the overview of the, of the presentation will be if you go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, the overview of the summer in, the, in era five, just um, talking about the temperature anomalies, the role of the atmospheric circulation and the predictability of the atmospheric circulation related to the, to the temperature anomalies. Then we will see how the Seasonal forecast models uh, have represent the, the summer of 2022 in the Copernicus uh, um, system models. And then Veronica will, will talk about the heat wave and the world night indices. So next slide. And uh, well, as uh, David has commented already, we have, um, well, we have uh, in Europe and Southwest Europe, we have experienced different, um, we have several uh, different patterns, let's say. So we focus in two regions. Once um, one region is uh, Europe, uh, we are considering also a, a part of the north of Africa because we are also interested in how is represented the coastal of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and then with the Southwest Europe. So those are the anomalies in the bottom uh, panel. Those are the anomalies for the uh, two meter temperature and um, in the whole world well, uh, for, the, for the summer from Jul June, July and August. And, um, and then in the top uh, panel, you can see the, the mean of all this region for the, uh, through the whole summer. So uh, in, in dashed lines, you see the, per, the, 90, the 90, per, um, 90 percentile. And uh, in red, we can see the Southwest Europe and in blue, the, the Europe. So what we see here is that the, at the beginning of the, of the period, at the beginning of the, of the summer, so in July, we reach uh, even uh, four uh, degrees of anomalies in the, in the case of the Southwestern Europe and uh, around the 15th of, of June. Then we have another peak in the middle of, of July as uh, also you, you have seen in the presentation of, of uh, David. And uh, in the case of Europe, we have, uh, you can see in the blue line that uh, the, the higher anomaly, temperature anomalies were in the, at the beginning of the summer and also at the end of the summer that were more corresponding to the, the Russian part. So if we move to the, to the next slide, we will see um, how this uh, um, summer, how, well, how the anomalies of, the, of, the, of all the summers are looking in the, in the case of Europe. This is a bit uh, moved, but in the, in the left panel is uh, the case for Europe and the right panel, the case of the Southwestern Europe. And uh, you can see the anomalies in, in, the, in the positive anomalies in red. And in the left panel, uh, we can see that the record was the 2021, considering the region that we, we have seen in the previous uh, slide. And uh, in the case of the Southwestern Europe in the right panel, um, what we have is the, the, that the record was the, the summer of 2022, and the second one was the summer of 2003. So, in order to see how it's affecting also the atmospheric circulation to these uh, um, temperature anomalies, uh, we have computed the, the, the weather regimes that are usual patterns, that we, the common patterns that we find in the, in the North Atlantic uh, area. So we have computed for the period of 1950 to 2022. And, um, and we can see, well, in green, uh, that the first in the top panel, you see the, the representation of these weather regimes. And uh, the first one is the Scandinavian blocking. So yeah, the, the, the most frequent one actually with a 30% with the, for the whole period of uh, based on SLP. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Then for the for the well the following one in, in frequency is the, the the positive phase of the North Atlantic oscillation, so with the high uh, pressure in the in the in the um, southwest uh, part of the of the Atlantic. Then the Atlantic low with the low pressure in the in the middle of the Atlantic, and then the Atlantic ridge, which is the the, the high pressure and uh, in the Atlantic, let's say. So in the case of the southwestern Europe, you can see in the bottom panel the representation of the of the corresponding weather regime for the for the summer of 2022 for each one of the of the day and in the in the y axis you see the the anomalies well temperature uh, anomalies in the dashed line you see the the 90 the 90 percentile and colors represent each one of the weather regimes so blue is the atlantic low uh, black is the is the north atlantic oscillation atlantic rich in red and blocking in in green what we can see for southwestern Europe is that we have more um, we have more um, uh, regimes corresponding to the Atlantic low and the North Atlantic oscillation, where most zonal regimes affecting the, the first part of the first heat wave, let's say, for the southwestern Europe. And then for the middle of uh, July, we have uh, a mix of, of, of all of these regimes, but uh, most of them are corresponding to the Atlantic low and, and Atlantic ridge. However, for the case of uh, Europe, in the following slide, we see that the, the most frequent, well, the highest anomalies were uh, at the beginning of the of the period, as we can uh, as we see in the in the previous uh, uh, in the anomalies uh, figure before. It was at the beginning of the summer and also at the end of the summer. But here, the the, the regimes corresponding to these higher temperatures were at the beginning of the uh, of the period most related to the Atlantic low. And at the end of the period, most related to the to the blocking. So, uh, in order to see how is the predictability the, uh, uh, related to this atmospheric circulation, just to the to the atmospheric circulation, we have um, applied one dynamical well uh, dynamical system theory that uh, that this uh, well the method can be uh, further investigated in these papers, the Faraday et al. 2017 and 2019. So what, what we can see in those papers is that we have uh, the, the tools to, to, to understand the predictability of the system, the intrinsic the predictability of the system, just measuring two properties in the, in the inner phase space. So measuring the local dimension, which means the, uh, the, um, the degree of freedom of, uh, of the system. So we, when we have less degrees of freedom, we have more predict, higher predictability. And and uh, we will be in this part of the attractor, so in the 0 0.25, uh, sorry, in, in five, uh, uh, in the first part of the X axis. And then we can also measure the persistence of the system. So how recurrent is uh, that pattern? It's one of the, of, the, of the blue points are corresponding to the daily SLP from 1950 to 2022. And in colors, we can see the most, um, well, the, 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 the the higher uh, heat waves, well, the, the, the huge heat, heat waves that we have experienced in Europe that are corresponding in yellow to the heat wave of 2003, in, um, in dark red in the, to, the, to the heat wave of 2010, and in the light red to the heat wave to the, to, well, to the current summer, no? summer of 2022. What we can see here is that we are located in the mid, well, we are close to the most predictable part in the attractor of the, uh, for, the, for the point related to the, to the heat waves uh, of 2000, to the summer of 2022. But indeed, uh, there were some days in the other heat waves or the other summers of 2003 and 2010 that were more, uh, that has more predictability uh, features than the, the current uh, summer. Indeed, when we are going to see where are located in, the, in this uh, attractor, the, the um, the, the days upper the, over the 90 percentile uh, corresponding to the two areas of study, so Europe and Southwest Europe, we see that the, they, are, they are in the middle of the attractor. So they are, they, they, they are not corresponding to any stream of this attractor. That means that they are not really high from the predictability, uh, the, the, the intrinsic, the intrinsic uh, predictability of the system. And they are not even um, bad predictable. Let's say so. Um, this is from the point of view of the predictability of the of the system in the uh, corresponding to the atmospheric circulation, but it will be interesting to consider here also the th thermodynamics and uh, 
uh, and consider also how is uh, how um, how is the belong of the of the other other variables like uh, the SST that were that was very important for the in the case of the of the Mediterranean and uh, also the Tmax. So if we see, if we want to see uh, the, how the models, uh, the seasonal forecast model are um, uh, predictability uh, at, pre at predicting the, the the summer of 2022, we can see here in this figure that actually is uh, is something that we uh, frequently publish every month in the Mediterranean seasonal climate update uh, that is uh, available for everyone in the Medscope uh, website. We see that uh, we divide the intersides. This is for the start date of, um, of May of, um, of 2022. And we can see in blue when we are in, in colder than normal conditions, in gray when we are in normal conditions, and in red when we are in warmer than normal conditions. We see that most of the model uh, within Copernicus, uh, the, most of the seasonal forecast model within Copernicus are, um, are, are predicting quite well the, 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 the war, the, well, the high temperatures in the, in the, for the summer of 2022, we see that everyone, most of them, has some warmer um, than normal conditions. For instance, the, the CMCC, WD, um, most of them, even, and, and, and mainly for the, for the ensemble of the, of the Copernicus models. Then if we see the scale of these models in the following slide, uh, in, in dark red, you can see the, the higher scale for the, for the uh, probabilities that we have uh, shown in the, in the previous slide. We see that, that some of the models like the CMCC, Meteo France, and, and, and the most important, the, the, the ensemble of the Copernicus are catching quite well. The, the, well, the scale is, is not that bad for the, for, the, for the case of the Mediterranean world, the Southwest Mediterranean, uh, that was the, the most affected for the heat wave. And the uh, next slide. Okay, so I will, the floor is yours, Veronica, you can. Thank you, Carmen. You can comment. Well, just to complement this analysis that Carmen explained on terms of the mean temperature in the season, we have, the, we have computed some indices that are usually created to, in order to characterize the intensity and duration of the heat waves. And in that case, I'm going to show you the results for the heat wave magnitude index, which is quite convenient for our study because it includes in only one value information on the duration and the amplitude of the heat wave. And it allows to compare also different regions and in addition to that, it is based on uh, the 90 percentile. So it's not affected by the mean biases that are affecting the seasonal prediction systems. So it allows to compare different systems as well. But in order to have a little bit more on the on details, we have analyzed separately the heat waves that are occurring at daytime and the warm night. This is because even if they are part of the same kind of uh, extreme event, the mechanism involved in the development of these heat waves and warm nights are slightly different. So they can the analysis, the separated analysis can provide more information on the specific conditions of one particular heat wave. So these are the results of this heat wave magnitude index for 2022. This is for the ERA-5 free analysis. And the results are in agreement with others that have been shown here. For example, those that David was showing with the highest values of these heat wave indices in the southern part of Europe. And I want to mention that the difference between the index computed at the daily basis with that computed for warm nights is the variable that has been used in order to define the indices. Because for the heat waves, we have used the daily maximum temperature. But for the warm nights, we have used the apparent temperature at night that take in, takes into account the temperature at night and also the humidity. So it can be considered as a measure of the heat stress that can affect more the, the health of the people. You can see that even if both indices are showing these high values in the Southern Europe regions, 
there, uh, apart from that, there are some differences between them. For example, the heat wave magnitude index for the daytime heat waves is showing high values in Russia. And for example, for the warm nights, we are having very high values in the Arabian Peninsula. So it's important to consider this separately. Just to provide more information on this, I'm showing the anomalies of the of the temperature for the daily te maximum temperature and for the apparent temperature. And you can see that the results are quite similar to the heat wave magnitude index. But with these anomalies, we can see a little bit more this intensity, for example, in terms of the values obtained for the daytime heat waves compared with the warm nights. Also, another index that we have computed is the number of days exceeding the 90 percentile that uh, in the case of the heat waves has been computed for the daily maximum temperature. And the number of days exceeding this threshold, it's much higher when we use the maximum temperature than if we use the apparent temperature. But both of them are showing in some regions uh, more than the 50% of the days exceeding this value, which implies that we have many days in which the temperature and also the apparent temperature conditions were particularly extreme. Just to compare, to compare the heat wave that was detected in 2022 with previous episodes, as they have been also discussed in previous presentations, you can see here the spatial distribution of the maximum anomalies. And it's true that in 2022, most of the uh, highest values obtained for this heat wave magnitude index are obtained in Southern Europe, even if, for example, in 2003, the heat wave magnitude index was much more intense in France, or even in the heat wave of 2010, we can see that the values were much higher than the ones that we have this year, but it was in another region. So here we can still see some small differences between the heat wave magnitude index based on the maximum temperature and that observed based only on the warm nights. Another analysis that we have done is how the seasonal predictions can are predicting these indices that I have been describing. And you can see that in general, uh, both for the heat waves and warm night indices, the seasonal forecast, in that, in that case, I'm only showing the results for the CMCC seasonal forecast system, are agree in these above normal conditions that have been already identified. But of course, the probability, the highest probability is obtained in slightly different regions. Also, you can see that when we consider the heat wave magnitude index, the results are a little bit more noisy that compared with, for example, the, max, the daily maximum temperature. Just to have an overview, not only on the heat wave of 2022, but to provide information on the skill in the retrospective period, we have analyzed the skill in terms of the ensemble mean correlation, and we have done this analysis for these four seasonal prediction systems, the one for CMCC, DWD, the ECMWF, and Major France. And we have computed the skill for all the different indicators um, for both heat waves and warm nights. I know that this is a, a large amount of information and I should <laughs> enter into details, but we don't have much time. So I only want to mention from here that you can see that the, in general, the skill of the dynamical systems to predict the heat waves for all the indices that we are considering here is much higher in Southern Europe than in Northern Europe. And also you can see that there are some specific uh, regions like for example in over Scandinavia where the skill is much more limited when we consider the daily maximum temperature that for example if we consider the apparent temperature at night. Also there are some differences between the individual systems that have been considered but the analysis of the drivers that are playing a role in this kind of heat waves should be addressed in order to understand well these differences. So just to conclude, these are our final remarks for this presentation. We have seen that we have a peak in the, in the summer warmest uh, temperature in 2001, but for Southern Europe, the record of the mean temperature was in, in, south, in this year, in this summer. Then also we have seen that the mean temperature anomalies also were uh, quite extreme, and particularly in Southern Europe, they exceed the four uh, degrees 
in average in the full domain. Also, we have seen that even if the blocking was the most frequent regime in summer, the anomalies in southwestern Europe were affected by this uh, frequency of the NAO and the Atlantic low. And also, we have shown that the NAO and the Atlantic low are more predictable. And, but even the, the summer of 2022 was on average less predictable than other cases, like, for example, the one into the heat wave that we observed in 2003. Then uh, it has been shown that the predictability from the dynamical system point of view uh, of days over the P night is not very high, and the value of the local dimension and persistence for those days are not in the extreme of the sea level pressure attractor. Finally, we have seen in terms of the indices that um, the, these values were much higher in Europe, uh, in Southern Europe, than those observed in previous years. And also that the seasonal forecast system were providing um, these above normal conditions, even if the skill of these systems is most restricted to the Southern part of Europe than in, in other locations. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carmen and Veronica. I guess we can move on with the last speaker and then open a session of questions. So the, the la our last speaker is Linus uh, Magnusson from uh, ECMW Math. Hi, Linus. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. So I mean, I mean, I'm going to move to a slightly shorter time scale than the talk mainly about the, the sub-seasonal forecast for uh, last summer using the ESMWF extended range forecasts. But just to recap, we have already heard about the evolution of um, the heat wave and the spatial pattern for uh, uh, last summer, but here, here I'm going to focus on uh, a, a box of covering most of Western Europe uh, in my analysis. And what you see in the time series here is in red, the evolution of the daily two meter temperature, in this box with da daily values in thin red lines and a uh, seven day running mean in uh, thick lines. You, you have the uh, daily climatology in a dashed line. And he here you see uh, going from June into the end of August, uh, these uh, free heat waves, so the June and then July and August that's melting together. I, I also here included in gray the seven day running mean from 2003 for the same box. And what one can notice is that uh, even, even if uh, 2003 kind of only had what, uh, one. A really strong heat wave. It was much longer and much longer than the one we had this summer, which probably affected uh, the health impact. So, if you look at the northern hemispheric anomalies in the era five, covering the sixth of August and twenty sixth of June to twenty eighth of August, uh, you you can see this heat wave uh, or, or a heat anomaly over Europe. You can also see other parts of the uh, of the world. For example, China that had a strong heat wave, and then you can see the precipitation anomalies in the uh, lower right panel, where we we have the dry anomaly uh, over Europe. We, uh, you you can see the wet anomaly over India and Pakistan which had a much stronger monsoon than normal, uh, leading to flooding. And also this dry band over uh, middle parts of China, where they experienced a, a severe drought. So, so what I've done in this, uh, uh, on, on this slide is now to make composites over, over this period, uh, 6th of June to 28th of August. So I choose the, these days to be the full calendar weeks uh, in the June, July, August season, because we produce our extended range forecast. Uh, uh, one of our main product is seven day running mean covering calendar weeks. 
So I here based my analysis on Monday forecast, and then I made composites of all extended range forecasts that was valid during this period. So on the top left, again, you see the anomaly from era five. But then on the middle panel, you see the composite based on a two week forecast. So, so from day seven to day 14. And you can see that the extended range forecast on this scale uh, predicted quite well the, both the magnitude and the full spatial extension of the heat wave over Europe. Uh, and then if we you go to the right uh, panel, you see the composite now on a uh, six week forecast. So the long, long, longest range we have in our extended range forecast. And also here you can see that uh, a, a warm anomaly was predicted over uh, Western Europe. But you can also see that it uh, extended further to the east into uh, Asia that actually had a, had a normal, uh, uh, more, more normal summer. You can also see that around this band, 30 north to 50 north, is almost all, all land masses on northern hemisphere that's warmer than normal. Then on the bottom one, you, you see the same type of plot, so era five, followed by two week forecast and six week forecasts for the precipitation anomaly. You can see that also the uh, dry anomaly was captured uh, fairly well on the two week forecast. And it was a, a signal or the broader uh, present on, uh, in, the, in the six week. You, and you can see on all these timescales that the, the wet anomaly of uh, India and parts of Pakistan were captured. And a, and a quite interesting feature that you can notice on this plot that both in the precipitation is the dry, dry band starting from the Caribbean going over the Atlantic up to uh, towards Europe. So that, that was, was how, I, how I, we predicted the, the seasonal average in the composite. So how, how did we do the, with the interseasonal variability? And here you can see the week by week uh, predictions and also the era five uh, uh, temperature in this Western Europe box I started off with in black. So you see these uh, three waves and week one forecast and uh, to some extent week two forecast captured the uh, these three uh, Maximus with this um, variability, although the week two forecast missed the last one in August. Then into week three, week four, we, we seem to lose this interseasonal variability in the prediction, although you can see that uh, all forecasts are far above the zero line in terms of anomaly. So to, to conclude this uh, subseasonal part, that uh, the system was able to capture on the longest scale, scales the uh, average temperature for the season, but a problem with the interseasonal, which uh, agrees with what we think about synoptic predict predictability of these waves. And then uh, also show that in our seasonal forecast from the 1st of May, that the, the, this pattern over Euros resembles well what we saw in the composite of the week six forecasts, both in temperature and in precipitation. But we can see that, uh, for example, this part of uh, uh, India and uh, Pakistan where it was uh, captured well. You can also notice that we uh, predicted uh, colder than normal in the tropical Pacific. So this recurrent La Nina that was used to be in uh, for the third year. So then uh, one can start to discuss, and this is uh, not, not any concluded work, but what, what's the connection between what happened in uh, the Enso region and over Europe? And when I was looking in, using the Clint 
timeshare data set we have uh, developed for range of climate indices and was looking into the uh, June, July, August 1980 to uh, 2020 monthly means. I actually saw that. Uh, yeah, for, for the uh, start with the past winter, it was actually what we call the East Atlantic pattern in the Z500, where that had the strongest pro projection this summer. So uh, that, that seems to be in the, a stronger pattern than the four uh, classical regimes that we uh, uh, mostly used. So I, I was looking into the correlation between uh, the an in Nino 3.4 index and uh, this East Atlantic pattern in this time series database and found some correlation 2.3, which is not, not, not too bad to be in, uh, uh, in uh, this uh, teleconnection world. And th this type of teleconnection in the summertime from the tro trop uh, tropical Pacific has been uh, discussed in the Wolf et al. paper and really et al. paper and uh, coming to a bit different conclusions, uh, these two papers, and it seems to be quite sensitive to where the heating appears in the tropical Pacific or the teleconnection to the, uh, the potential over the Eastern Atlantic works. So to summarize, we had a good signal in extended range forecast for the com composites over the summer and uh, we saw a, a similar signal uh, in the in the seasonal forecast from first of may but uh, uh, after, for longer than week two forecast it was difficult to capture the intra-seasonal variability and uh, then we, we, one can discuss and that, that that's where i think the machine learning tools can help to see and dig into these teleconnections in the summer for, from the tropics into uh, both Enso and Indian Mosu into uh, the European temperatures. Let's stop that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Linus. I guess we can uh, start with question for Linus in the room, if any. No question for you, Kenneth. Thank you very much. Uh, and then maybe Eduardo, can you come here? There are two questions for you, and then we can ask also the room whether they have questions for you as well. So one question from Martin Bergman is, uh, uh, what does your model analysis reveal about the precursors of such event, sea surface temperatures or moisture? Etc. <laughs> um, well, um, at the present state, not yet very much. And so it will be a, a focus of analyzing this uh, the model, these several model simulations, uh, as in the way observations. So actually, this analysis that has, needs to be done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then there's another question, uh, which is about the relationship between uh, volcanism and also. And yeah, um, yeah um, I think um, perhaps I, I didn't explain it very well, but it was too quick. And um, so the, the, the person asking is saying that I identified a strong impact of volcanism on the uh, circulation pattern of this year, but that's not the case. Actually, what the simulation is indicating is that there is a very weak or non existent uh, impact of external forces. Okay, thank you very much. Questions for the public for Robert? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Uh, last one is a uh, last one is a general question by Natalie. I don't know who want to take it. Natalie is asking maybe all of you. Natalie is asking a general question about uh, what are the challenges for evaluating uh, the severity of a drought uh, from uh, an end user perspective. So, for example, was the 2022 worse than the 23 drought uh, from a human health uh, perspective in terms of temperature, relative humidity, wind, etc.? Uh, what about ecological impact? Maybe Arthur, you from the observatory. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, 
Yeah, no, thank you for the question. It's uh, it's quite interesting and it's uh, something that is rather challenging as well to 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 be considered. So, um, so basically, like uh, something that really plays a role into that would be, for instance, the the the, the duration and actually when it, a draft event starts. You know, because this, for instance, can have impacts in different types of sectors. So the easiest one for us to be discussing is agriculture, of course. And uh, if you have some sort of drought event that uh, that is covering, of course, the the the, the growing season, particularly like the beginning, it, this can have a, a, a wired and, and most like a severe impact than a drought event that might be happening just in the end of the growing season. So this is uh, it's something that uh, that is rather tricky to be like uh, let's say take into account into into impact modeling, and uh, I think it's some challenge also for for the clean network to, to try to analyze a bit that. All right, thank you. And uh, there's a final uh, question, comment, maybe some of you want to comment it. Frank Bosco, yeah, it's, it's, sure, please. Yeah, can you uh, please come up? Sorry. In Spain, there's a, now a mystery in mortality because we have had like a excess mortality lasting since the beginning of the of the summer and uh, it, it has only stopped uh, now in at the end of uh, september because in spain there is a a, <clears throat> a special system which is focused on uh, analyzing almost in real time with just one week delay the the the, the mortality attributed to to heat and uh, the epidemiologists did not, don't, are not able to find now an explanation of how the excess mortality has kept so high during, during so much uh, time. So I guess that this is one of the things, even we, we have a well-developed early warning system, and we supposedly to reduce the impact of mortality. This year, the mortality has been well above what was expected from uh, uh, the models which have been trained when dealing with individual heat waves. So perhaps there, there, is a, there are challenges to, to try to, to model adequately this new reality where we may spend like 80 or 90 years in a heat wave conditions. Just a Thank you very much. And then uh, finally, uh, Carlos, Franco Bostolo is, uh, should we keep speaking about climate change or should we better talk about climate crisis? We want to comment this. <laughs> um, well, okay. <laughs> uh, well, it, it depends on the objective. I mean, from the scientists will, will uh, hesitate in using the, the term climate crisis because it's not objective. And uh, if you want to attack the problem from an objective point of view, uh, then I think we shouldn't do it. Um, if if your focus is in, in, let's say, communicating to policymakers or stakeholders or the public, then you may have other choices, of course. All right, I will say with that, we can close okay. the <laughs> webinar. Thank you for our speakers and presenters. First, thank you for to all the attendees, many, actually more than 140 from from all. Hi Carmen, I was a presenter remotely. Bye bye.